Welcome to our program, The World. Today I have a distinct pleasure to welcome a well-known architect, educator, urban or green designer, Jason Pomeroy, who happened to be in Slovakia. Welcome to our program. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. Jason, usually I am hosting here diplomats, foreign policy experts, and these, uh, particularly last weeks, we are focused on war and settling all these disruptions, what we see in the world. But I was particularly happy when I learned that you will be in time uh, in town and looking at your uh, rich uh, and diverse portfolio of activities, I would like to have like refreshment for our viewers. And uh, start with first question, what brought you to Slovakia? Is this your first visit? Do you know, it, you're absolutely right. It is my first visit to Slovakia, though I'm no stranger to Europe, being half English and half Malaysian and having grown up in London for the majority of my life. Um, what brought me to, um, to Slovakia, and in particular Bratislava, was, I guess, an element of serendipity. I have a TV show on smart cities where I go around the world looking at what makes these great cities smart, whether it is the, the people smarts mm -hmm. or is it the tech smarts. And I had the pri privilege and pleasure of um, seeing that certain uh, officials have caught um, the attention of, of the research that I was doing, which was then translated into TV. And it provided a platform for us to have a conversation about what is actually going to be making uh, a difference in people's lives on the ground in Bratislava. So the ability to come over and have conversations in and around the lecture theatre mm -hmm. and having wonderful conversations with yourself right now and also with members of civil society was what got me out of bed to, to come mm -hmm. here and, uh, and certainly learn a bit more about this great city as well. So you spend here for about two days. Just uh, two days. And uh, tell us briefly about your program and what struck you. Is Bratislava smart enough? Oh, that's a very good question. Well, first of all, about the program, Smart Cities was an opportunity to explore eight cities from around the world. And ultimately, the frame of reference was, is it really... Um, all about the technology, or is it about citizen co-creation, and is it the mm -hmm. people smarts that makes these places smart? And so I was able to go from Ahmedabad in India, where the notion of smartness is all about a city that has running water, sanitation, mm -hmm. electricity. But you go to a place like Shenzhen or Songdo uh, in Asia, and it's all about the technology to enhance the economy. So. Wherever you go in the world, there's a very different view of what makes a place smart or whether it's a smart mm -hmm. city. Um, I like to look across the border uh, at Bratislava to Vienna, yeah. and you've got a smart city in its happenings there as well. I actually think that Br Bratislava is a smart city in its own right. There's a real strong element of citizen co-creation. I do get the sense of wonderful opportunities for e-mobility, whether it is through electric charging or whether it's through your tram system. And I do think that there is a pathway to make the place smarter and greener. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to hopefully being part and parcel of this journey. Excellent. So I hope that this was not one-off. Do you expect after these two days that you establish some relations which can last and probably you may even develop a few partnerships and projects? Well, I certainly hope so. And I think that it's always in the spirit of collaboration, mm -hmm. doesn't it? I mean, yeah. um, there's no point in me coming over wearing the architect or the academics hat from either London or Singapore, where I currently am practicing. Uh, it's always about trying to learn lessons from the locale. What is the culture of the place, the climate of the place? What is the, um, the, the historic situation of the place? And how can we then start to augment that with other learnings from around the world? And I guess the privilege of being both uh, an academic and as a practicing architect and urban planner with a TV show that allows us to do very broad frames of reference and research is that we do get a window onto different happenings, mm -hmm. different innovations, different ideas. And if there is a way that we can also share that knowledge um, in, in a completely transparent way to allow uh, the locale, yeah. Bratislava or Slovakia, to um, embrace some of those ideas, then I hope that it will lead to a greener future. Mm -hmm. Would like to map a bit uh, 
your diverse interests uh, because sometimes people are focused only on academic teaching somebody is just architect and somebody is just tv anchor and yes. you are emphasizing that you are all of these yes, no. yes, uh, right. try to tell me three most significant things which you are proud of oh, in the field of architecture like which it. you would like to showcase that these are three things which I achieved in the world of architecture, which I am proud of, or which are making me happy. Well, you know, they always say those who can do, those who can't teach. Yeah. But I would like to think that I've managed to sort of reframe mm -hmm. that rule. Yeah, we will come to your teaching things. <laughs> Let's start with architecture. I, I would say that I'm most proud of the work that really has a strong evidence-based interdisciplinary approach to design. And those are often the design projects that have been born out of research. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the first zero carbon house in Asia, called the Idea House, was a prototypical house that really revolutionized sustainable tropical living in the Asian region. It was born out of the principles of the, the heritage kampong houses mm -hmm. of Malaysia. And the ability to reinterpret that in a modern way, using modern materials, using digital technology, and ultimately bringing the heritage home into the 21st century was what I was particularly mm -hmm. proud of, because it then formed the foundations to scaling the idea from the prototype house to zero carbon districts to then zero carbon neighborhoods and cities. Mm -hmm. Excellent in teaching. Do you have some students which you were br bringing to sort of uh, uh, interest in the field you are dealing with, who is successful by now, where your teaching played profound role in developing skills or some results by st some students of yours, whether in Asia or in Europe? I think absolutely. I mean, I, I think that it is um, it's a very interesting question because what I don't try to do is create clones of my research. I think what I'm particularly proud of is the research that I've been involved with um, over the last 15 or so years has been around sustainability and zero carbon mm -hmm. development. And I'm particularly happy that the frame of reference that looks beyond the typical social, economic and environmental principles of sustainability and goes beyond to embrace culture, space and technology has influenced um, architects in, uh, in Europe, in, in the Middle East and, and in Asia, particularly um, individuals who have then gone on to set up their own design practices with a research mm -hmm. base. And so what I'm particularly happy with is that I'm not trying to dictate to them what their research or their design should be in the future, but it's providing them with the tools, the foundations to build their own futures. Mm -hmm. And so I'm delighted to you know, think of you know, particular individuals. Uh, for instance, there's a gentleman called Arham Dowdy, who was my intern mm -hmm. many years ago in Singapore, who basically went on to study further, went on to set up his own practice, and he has research as his core foundation with his design practice. Excellent. Uh, you have unique experience in teaching both in Singapore, Venice, UK. Yes. So you were exposed to students from various cultures, mm. nationalities. Today we are looking at Asia, which is booming. And yes. very often we are complaining that if Europe will not catch up mm. with technological advancement, innovation mm. with the United States or Asian countries, that we will have some difficulties in future. Mm -hmm. Teaching, from teaching point of view, how it fit, what are the differences in teaching in Asian uh, environment yes. and European environment? That's a really good question too. I mean, I think that there is this, um, this tendency to look at the tutor in an Asian context as, as almost being the pathway to facts and truth and reason. It's a very Confucianist mm -hmm. idea that the person at a senior level in an authoritative, fatherly, paternal role almost, or maternal in that, in that respect, um, is going to tell you exactly what you need to know and you need to listen 
and you don't question. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know, though, that the, the, the Western methodology of teaching is one where you're not necessarily dictated to a particular answer, but there is the opportunity for the student to ask the question, why? And for the tutor to kind of say, well, why don't you try and find out and I'll try and provide an element of guidance. So I guess the fundamental difference between the two lecture theatres, if you will, is that if I am teaching in, in the East, there is a, a slightly greater tendency to be more prescriptive, mm -hmm. to give out the notes, to be able to provide a certain element of answer. Whereas obviously when I'm teaching at Cambridge, um, there is a greater opportunity to have very diverse conversations, a greater discourse around the question why. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this? For what reason? And really challenging the student to stretch themselves to find the right answer. And then when it comes to the Middle East, somehow I find the it's, it's been a weird and wonderful um, environment where I do sometimes see the combination of both. Mm -hmm. And I'm also talking about policy makers, leaders, um, in the executive MBA program that I was, I was teaching on um, in Saudi Arabia uh, a while ago, there was that beauty of being prescriptive, but then also mm -hmm. having these very long conversations in and around the reasons as to why we are doing what we are doing. Uh, how do you see development of academia in the United Kingdom versus United States, uh, because UK universities still rank among top in the world. You are still capable of constant innovation. You are attracting the smartest people. Is America getting better or UK <laughs> is getting better? Oh, that's such a leading question, <laughs> <laughs> but, but wonderful in, its, in, in equal measure. Um, if we look at the QS uh, the QS ranking mm -hmm. system of, of leading institutions in the world. I'm always delighted to see, as my alma mater is yeah. Cambridge, to see Cambridge in the top five. Mm -hmm. and, and currently, I think, we're, I think, if I'm not mistaken, we might be three, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, and there's always this wonderful rivalry between Cambridge and Harvard, mm -hmm. basically Oxbridge yeah. and, and the Ivy League. There is no denying that the, the bursaries, uh, the, the funding of US universities are, are really quite remarkable, quite substantial. That's not to say that the bursaries associated with Oxford and Cambridge or, or the other great Russell Group universities um, in the UK are not small. They're not. But I do think that there are greater, greater funding opportunities when you look mm -hmm. at uh, these US institutions. I would like to think, though, that the, um, the, the spirit of collaboration is strong. And I do think that partnerships between institutions is going to be key to unlocking mm -hmm. some of those major obstacles and hurdles when it comes to climate change, resilience, um, and even breakthroughs in, 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 in sort of cancer research, for instance, as we move forward. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that we will see greater funding into UK universities that will make us more competitive. And certainly, having to bring up Brexit here, I mean, when we yeah. look at a post-Brexit uh, world, we certainly want to be encouraging more um, Asian students heading towards um, UK universities, which is why I s established a scholarship to support Asian students going to Cambridge. Do you think that Brexit hurt? Uh universities in UK? I, I don't think it helped, but I think that we have to kind of look past these these um, these decisions and actually look for greater opportunities to embrace a greater um, student pool. Um, we need to ensure that we are remaining competitive with an increasingly diverse um, body of academics and academic subjects. Um, we're looking at increasing competition from Europe, from Australia, mm -hmm. and what that means is that we need to be keeping up with the Joneses, mm -hmm. so to speak. I do think, though, that the heritage of UK education is strong, and I'm delighted to be part and parcel of that yeah. journey and seeing a lot of Asian students moving in that direction. I would like to move to global themes nowadays. Uh, you were think, talking about smart cities. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, people around the world are seeing a lot of disruptions, mm -hmm. a lot of challenges in the field of environment, in field of health. We yes. are just uh, pandemic, uh, uh, coronavirus hit us totally unprepared. We are still coping with that. Uh, also now outbreak of war in Ukraine. You are in a country where just over 60,000, well, uh, I mean, refugees, mostly mothers with children, yes. 
uh, living with us in our environment. And on Monday, we are celebrating uh, anniversary of end of Second World War and Europe's day. Mm -hmm. And we will be dealing with all of these issues which mm -hmm. we are confronted with. Uh, many people suggest that post Second World War arrangement is uh, getting basically enormous hits, uh, UN Charter is violated and so on. So how do you see from both Asian and European and your personal perspective these major disruptions which we are confronted with? Mm. I think that um, what we can see with cataclysms, whether it's a climate change related cataclysm or a, a war inflicted cataclysm like what we're seeing mm -hmm. with um, Ukraine and Russia, or whether it's a pandemic cataclysm, it suddenly sharpens the mind. We can, as humans, become incredibly complacent. When the going is good, we forget about the other circumstances that could, at the flip of a coin, suddenly turn yeah. our world into turmoil. What's just remarkable is that over the period of the last, you know, half a decade, if you will, we've seen this compression of um, greater um, uh, reporting on the climate change woes, the pandemic and this conflict, which basically sharpens the mind even more. But what I do believe is that out of these cataclysms come these remarkable uh, resurgence of resilience and fortitude. And that's where we as humans, I guess, <laughs> have to excel to survive. Many years ago, I was filming in a, in a place called Higashi Matsushima. Um, it was the site of the, um, the, the town was the, the place of the, um, the tsunami, which was so powerful, that effectively, you know, the, the earthquake created the tsunami, which then led to the Fukushima nuclear reactor meltdown. And the sheer, you know, uh, climatic and human scale cataclysm decimated the town, brought it to ruin. Many lives were lost. But out of that, um, out of that sort of cataclysm, that disaster, um, a, a spirit of resilience was born. The people turned around and thought, we can't rely on nuclear power as the sole source of energy. Mm -hmm. They pushed for energy deregulation. They started to think, let us embrace clean energy, wind turbine technology, solar technology. They looked at the waterways. They thought, how can we be more flood resilient in the future? They started to move parts of the town inland to avoid such flood impact. They realized that they needed to create housing systems that were far more connected, eco-friendly. They also realized that they wanted to work with the government to run their own communities as opposed to being sort of led by the government. In that respect, this 50-50 partnership between government and the community that allowed for deregulation of energy, the embrace of clean energy, modular construction, um, a, a safer environment to live in, was all born out of this culture of resilience. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the same is happening with other cataclysms. And that, I guess, is the wake-up call that we need as society. That is having a huge impact on the way that we start to shape our urban habitats, our neighborhoods, our districts. And I take a lot of comfort out of mm -hmm. that. It means that the research that we do from these cataclysms informs better designed solutions so that the people can sustain their lives and their children's lives in a more sustainable way. You are dealing in various political environments mm -hmm. uh, where central planning or top-down decision-making process versus bottom-up or pluralistic yes. uh, is shaping almost every aspect of life. Where, with your mindset and your activities, where you are aiming to build smart cities, mm -hmm. smart solutions for individuals, communities, uh, country, uh, where do you see challenges which, or how they differ between European and Asian context? Very good question. I think that you often find that in the first generation of those smart cities, that, as you say, was a very top-down approach, yeah. a government-driven approach, often sees the, the, the hand of control in the governments that have a particular vision about um, creating a forward-looking economy that is enabled by technology 
and the large corporation. So technology and large financial institutions having a role to play with the government in shaping a city mm -hmm. like Songdo in Korea. Songdo was built as a means of transforming the North Asian uh, economic growth model in and around um, Korea. And associated with the airport, it provided this catalyst for urban growth in the future. The flip side to that is, well, where do the people fit in? How can the people's views be embraced? And if you look at, for instance, a smart city in Southeast Asia like Bandung, you've got a city that appreciates the role of technology, but they put the technology into the hands of the people. Mm -hmm. So the mayor of Bandung said, tell me what your problems are to his 1.5 million constituents. Tweet, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. You report to me what your issues are. And his effectively data command center, which was uh, a depository for people's views, were sifted using algorithms to then pinpoint crime, congestion, pollution, those, those touch points mm -hmm. that were common to the people. And he was then able to deploy his resources wisely to solve those issues. Now, these are both two very different smart cities, one which is top down, mm -hmm. one which is I bottom see. up. Mm -hmm. But arguably, when I look at places like Vienna, Amsterdam, Barcelona, you don't have just the government as a top-down approach or just civil society with a bottom-up mm -hmm. approach to saying this is what we want. We also see the active role of private corporations saying we see that there is a model here to make business sense. Mm -hmm. And we also see academia saying, do you know what, we can test these ideas and if they work for the greater good of society, then why wouldn't we want to do this together? So this quadra partite relationship where civil society say this is our need, academia say this can work, corporations saying that we can fund this, and the state ratifying to say that this is for the greater good, mm -hmm. that's the model that I'm seeing increasingly being embraced, not just in Europe, but also in yeah. Asia. Mm -hmm. And we've been delighted to be part of many smart district mm -hmm. models in Jakarta, in Kuala Lumpur, in Johor, even in the Middle East, in, in Saudi Arabia, where we're starting to see this sort of nature mm -hmm. happening. Excellent. This morning, when I was preparing myself for this interview, I got a bunch of images from a friend who is just visiting Ukraine. Okay. And he was just showing housing developments, blocks of flats completely ruined, mm. civilian targets and so on. Have you ever been to Ukraine? I'm afraid not, but I would love and to go at some point. Would you like to go? I would. I think that I think that that country will desperately need assistance of yes. many of us after war is over. Absolutely. So I hope that this would be extremely important with uh, your profile mm. to inspire people and help you know, come out with some lessons learned from other solutions because this will be completely new situation. Absolutely. Post-war uh, mm. uh, rebuilding of whole yes. country. In conclusion, your last head, media head. Today, many wealthy people mm. are thinking about having impact through media, particularly social media. Mm. Donald Trump is thinking about one. Mm. Uh, now, Twitter was acquired by Elon Musk, and yes. he wants to have this. Uh, why are you engaged in media business? Do you want to be like Donald Trump or Elon Musk, or how you use media in developing your ideas of service to countries, communities, in sort of developing your idea of doing good things? I'm not a media person. I mean, I'm an architect by training. I'm an academic by passion. And it's this wonderful opportunity to turn the evidence-based approach to my research to influence the commercial realities of designing and building cities, buildings, landscapes, that really gets me out of bed in the morning. And ultimately, this um, opportunity to reach a broader audience beyond my academic book publications or my lecture notes 
with a small handful of people. I mean, certainly my, my books are not selling like J.K. Rowling. <laughs> they're, 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 they're probably a dry read. Um, I thought that the opportunity which arose purely because I was asked to present a show on architecture many years ago was a good opportunity to embed a greener message. Um, I had a show called City Time Traveller where I was asked to retell the tale of the culture of cities in the Asian region. What makes the cities the way they are? And ultimately, cities are born out of the interactions of people, out of trade and commerce, and cities grow through their trading prosperity. But I also thought that there was a message there, a greener message, as to how cities can be more sustainable. That led to other series. And ultimately, it comes down to this. If, if I can reach a handful of students in a lecture theatre, and I'm kind of old school analogue to, to a certain extent, but I can then reach out further through digital or broadcast media to touch the lives of a seven-year-old child or a 70-year-old grandparent, then I think that I'm doing my job in influencing the system for a greener future. And as long as I can impart a message of truth, of fact, of reason, relating to sustainable built environments and highlighting the cataclysmic effects of climate change or, or, or social upheaval, to ensure that people are acknowledging the truth in order to then understand why the system is the way it is and how we can create better places to live, work, play, learn and heal, then I feel that I'm doing my job. Mm -hmm. It's another tool, it's another avenue to be able to influence the system. Excellent. Out of today's personalities from the field of academia, out of architectural field, uh, out of business area, what, who are the people whom you admire or whom you like to watch and get inspiration for yourself? That's such a mind-blowing question because um, I've always actually looked to the past for my, um, my inspirations. Um, Sir Christopher Wren, <laughs> who was basically a... Um, he, he was the architect of St. Paul's mm -hmm. Cathedral. Mm -hmm. He was the surveyor general to the king, King Charles. Um, he was a mathematician. He was an astronomer. He was a true multidisciplinarian who was able to bring various strains of thought together to effectively remap London and, and create a better London out of the ashes of the great fire of yeah. London. I have huge admiration and was inspired mm -hmm. to eventually become an architect. I'm afraid I have to use him as that source of mm -hmm. inspiration because when you think of the Pandora's box that we are currently facing with, and we have opened up the Pandora's box of climate change, of war, of the pandemic, um, we need to now sort of put the lid on Pandora's box. There was one thing in Pandora's box that was really quite remarkable. That was the only thing that was in there after all hell was broken loose, and that was hope. Yeah. And arguably, when I look at the past, which I often get a lot of inspiration from, the Great Fire of London was ravaged, and it was the end of, of that central part of London. But out of the ashes came a new London, St. Paul's Cathedral, and some remarkable buildings. Um, what I'm thinking is that sometimes you take a cataclysm and you turn it into a rebirth, mm -hmm. a new opportunity. And I don't want to be pessimistic. I want to remain optimistic that this is an opportunity yeah. for Ukraine to have a new lease yeah. of life. And I'm afraid he is my source of inspiration mm -hmm. from the past. Excellent. And um, I hope to be able to continue that sort of legacy by creating better sustainable mm -hmm. futures, either that's through bricks and mortar of design or academic works through research or, or broadcast media. Uh, I will link this last response. St. Paul's Cathedral is one of my favorites. My name is Pavel, which is Paul. Uh, but I was in London about two months ago, and I made not only photographs, but short video of Ukrainians singing national Ukrainian anthem on the steps in front of St. Paul's Cathedral, which I would be happy to send you. Please do. I mean. Um because there is strong diaspora 
of Ukrainians in London, and they have even their church there. So this was very powerful. When I came and saw them singing with national flag, so this connection of UK, London, Ukraine, what, and I think also UK nowadays is a remarkable approach and spirit helping that country as well. Absolutely, and we are trying everything that we can to support students yeah. uh, from Ukraine um, by thinking about workshops that can actually support their education, scholarships that can support their education, and also kind of um, forging new collaborations that will allow us to think about the design of zero carbon housing and modular housing and also disaster relief housing yeah. that might be of benefit to um, society when they do start yeah. to repopulate. Jason, I think that this went uh, very well. I'm very happy that I had chance to know you and I'm sure that this is not the last time. Whenever you are in Bratislava, it would be my great pleasure to meet with you either here or somewhere in downtown cafe. When I will be in London or Singapore, I will ring you. Indeed. But also, it would be my desire that once you will be giving lecture in Kiev or some other Ukrainian city, I would definitely attend. Pavel, I would absolutely love that opportunity. And the door is open to you, whether that is in Singapore, yeah. London, and I certainly will look forward to that chance to meet again in Bratislava. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.